Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what time you're watching this. I am Chris Carrado. I am your host of the political show here on RockHillVideo.com. As I probably said, and you've heard me say it before, before every show starts, I always like to let everybody know when we bring our guests on, this isn't an opportunity to bash anyone, to praise anyone. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, news media out there that looks to just bring somebody on and hold them so high or put them down in the dirt. We don't do that. This is an equal opportunity for those to talk. This isn't Chris Carrado's show to let everybody know exactly how he feels. I like to give our guests the opportunity to share that. So today we have on Spike Cohen. Uh, Spike Cohen is going to be the VP uh, for Joe Jorgensen. She is the libertarian candidate running for president. And I asked him to come on the show so he could tell us a little bit about you know, himself, um, libertarianism, uh, Joe Jorgensen, and what they're looking to accomplish. So Spike, thank you for coming on today. Thanks for having me on, Chris. I really appreciate it. I'm, I've been looking forward to this all day. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So, is there just a little bit you want to share about yourself before we get started? Sure, absolutely. I am a, a business owner. I have uh, started and uh, operated uh, multiple successful businesses over the course of the last uh, 21 years. Uh, I actually started a web design business back in 1999. Uh, and uh, now, full time, I am the uh, host of My Fellow Americans, the co host of the Muddy Waters of Freedom, and the co owner of Muddy Waters Media. Uh, my career, as it were, has been uh, pursuing my passion, which is spreading the message of liberty far and wide to uh, outside to the public that uh, often hasn't heard of our ideas, hasn't heard of libertarian ideas. Uh, I, seven months ago, I decided to seek the Libertarian Party's nomination for vice president. Our, si our system is a little bit different, where uh, instead of the presidential nominee being picked and then that nominee choosing who they want to run with them, we actually pick our president and vice president separately. So I decided to run for vice president uh, on a ticket of, of uh, promoting and promising to spread the message of liberty uh, to the public and, and get as many people people turned on to the uh, the ideas of behind libertarianism as possible. And on the strength of that, the, uh, the delegates saw fit to pick me as the nominee. So now I am running with Joe Jorgensen on her campaign and her, her platform to set America free and to remove the burdens and barriers that the Republicans and the Democrats have put in place and solve the problems that they've created in their exclusive control of every lever of government uh, for the last 160 plus years uh, so that people can live better lives and thrive and, and do better and, and come up with far better solutions to the problems than the bad centrally planned decisions that have been made by the pandering craven politicians in the uh, Republican and Democratic parties. Okay, thank you, Spike. So you actually are from South Carolina too, right? Yep, I live in Myrtle Beach, and I've been here for thirty, gosh, thirty-three years. So yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely uh, I'm a Myrtle Beacher. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start with the questions, and we could probably combine these two in one. So a lot of people, you know, they as far as they know, you know, you know, you had Donald Trump running for president, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, Mike Pence is his VP and he's going against Joe Biden, who hasn't picked his VP yet. But there's other choices, other opportunities for people to pick other people that might align more with what they want for this country. So can you tell us uh, what is a, a libertarian? And can you tell us some common misconceptions about this party? Sure, so libertarianism, I, my, my little elevator speech version of libertarianism, because it's a very you know deep philosophy and you could spend days or weeks talking about it, but. Uh, libertarianism at its core is a belief that each of us, each of you, own yourselves and your lives and your bodies. And because you own that, you also own your labor. And because you own your labor, you own the product of your labor, which is yours as your property. And you exclusively own this. You have the right to exclusive ownership and enjoyment of all of these things. And you can give them away, uh, sell them, lend them out, share them as you see fit because they're yours and you have the right to do that. And we believe that it is the best way for a society to function is for us to respect each other's self-ownership and autonomy and in, in being able to make choices for their own uh, their own things that they own, including themselves, and that we work together in cooperation and in competition to be able to uh, thrive and be able to build a society built on respecting each other's, uh, basically their, each, other's, um, you know, each other's bodies and their lives and so forth. And that when people violate that, when, when people try to take from others and harm them, that's an act of aggression. 
And aggression isn't just good, it isn't just bad because it's wrong to aggress against people, it's morally wrong to harm people or to take their stuff. Uh, it also doesn't work. If I can take from you, Chris, and uh, and from you know everyone else that's watching and listening to this, uh, whenever I see fit, I'm not going to be a good steward of what I have. I'm not going to make good choices because I don't have to. I can just take more from you whenever I see fit. And the rest of y'all aren't going to necessarily make the best choices with what you have because you know I can come and take it from you at any time. And the systems that have been put in place and the bad policies that have been put in place by the Republicans and the Democrats working in lockstep with each other are basically just systems whereby they've proclaimed and presumed the authority to take from all of us whenever they see fit and tell us and order us around and tell us what to do. It has led to the very uh, inequitable and harmful and abusive outcomes that we have come to expect from Republicans and Democrats. Uh, all of the things that we are facing right now that are, that are problems that people are out in the streets protesting are as a direct result of the bad, aggressive, aggressive policies of the Republicans and Democrats. And we as libertarians believe in, uh, in reforming and dismantling those systems as needed and replacing them with voluntary-based solutions that allow people to actually make choices for themselves, taking the power out of the hands of the politicians, the bureaucrats, and their billionaire cronies that have bought and paid for them and put them in their places of power, and putting that power back in the hands of you and your loved ones and your communities so you can solve these problems for yourself and stop having more problems put on you by those same pandering and craving politicians. Thank you, Spike. So, like I said, there's, there's might be some common misconceptions about libertarianism and... Oh, uh, sorry, that was this, yeah, I'm sorry, that was the second part of your question. That's so, okay. There was, think I often, go ahead. There was gonna say, there's a couple examples I wanted to give you if you don't mind speaking sure. on it. So yeah. a lot of times people say, oh, libertarianism, those are just uh, angry white Republican guys who want to smoke pot. I'm sure you've heard that a million times. <laughs> so I just want to know, you know, what do you think about that? And what do you think about someone saying, oh, libertarianism or any other third party that's just a wasted vote? And by voting for this guy or this gal in this case, it's just, uh, you might as well just vote for one of the other guys. Yeah, so we hear a lot of that. We hear, uh, we'll hear a lot of misconceptions. Oddly enough, from usually from Republicans and Democrats, you know, they'll say, w w the Democrats will say, oh, they're just a bunch of right wingers who just want to smoke weed and have all, all their own money and they don't care about poor people. And then, you know, the, the people on the right, the Republicans will say, oh, they're just in this because they want to legalize everything and have everyone be a bunch of heathens out in the streets. And they, you know, and, and they're trying to steal votes from Republicans uh, to try to, you know, so that the Democrats can win. And the Democrats will say they're trying to steal Democrat votes uh, so that the Republicans can win. And what we say is that we wish the two of y'all would stop trying to steal votes from us so that we could win. <laughs> um, because we're not really worried about which one of y'all win because you're both terrible and have created the problems that we face. Regarding the wasted vote thing, I would argue that a wasted vote is voting for the very same politicians and the very same political parties who have created all of the problems that we are facing right now or been unable to stop them and who every four years they come back to you and say, this time, if you elect us, we will totally fix all those problems that we keep creating and being unable to fix and usually just making worse. This time with your vote, we will absolutely fix that. I totally promise you that. That's a wasted vote. Uh, they're clearly gaslighting us. They're clearly lying to us. They're clearly just, you know, they want us to have this idea that there's only two choices. They both suck and you have to pick from one of them. Uh, and the idea that in a nation of 330 plus million people that you should only have two terrible choices uh, <laughs> demonstrates to me what a wasted vote is. A wasted vote is voting Republican or Democrat. Got it. Thank you. Um, so we all know that not everybody is going to become a libertarian. So how do you feel that you could make your party more attractive to a You know, someone just say, look, I'm just a conservative or I'm just a liberal and that's the way I'm going to be. But you know what? I think I might want to vote libertarian. How do you think you can get them to at least consider voting this way? Well, the thing is, we look at what their values are. Because whether you're a conservative or you're a liberal or a progressive or you're a centrist or a moderate or anything else, we have, been, we have been sold a lie that if you're on the right, you need to believe that people on the left hate everything. They hate people and they hate America and they, they, you know, they, they hate white people or they hate whatever, you know, and, and, and that they're just filled with hatred and their, their wants and desires are bad. 
people on the left are told the same thing about Republicans. Republicans, they hate minorities. They hate you know people of you know of, of color. They hate poor people. They just want people to suffer. And so they're told that people who don't agree with we're told that people that don't agree with us politically want bad things to happen. They, they're filled with hatred of others. And, that's simply untrue. If you look at the vast, vast majority of people out there across the political spectrum, they want good things. We have differences of opinions about how to get there, uh, but they want good things. They're they're worried about the, their future. They're worried about the future of their of their families and their children and their loved ones. And so, the best way to reach someone is to agree with their concerns. People that are concerned about the cost of health care, they're concerned about whether they're going to be able to keep their job. They're worried about if the if the if their wages are, are going to be able to go up, or at least you know be the be you know go up to the rate of uh, the same rate as the cost of living increases. They're worried about inflation. They're worried about uh, student uh, loans, that their student loan debt. They're worried about health care costs. They're worried about legitimate things. And so we simply show them that we agree with them that these are things that need to be addressed. And then we demonstrate to them how the Republicans and the Democrats have either created those problems or made them worse, or in most cases, created the problems and made them worse, and how common sense libertarian solutions are the ways to fix those problems and to make it so that those problems never happen again. Um, and so it's really just a matter of meeting people where they are, uh, empathizing with their situation, identifying what their concerns are, and then showing them that the answer to their concerns is the libertarian way. Thank you. So uh, next question would be, why are you and Joe Jorgensen, uh, let's be a little bit more specific, why are you the better opportunity than, say, voting for Trump and getting Pence back in there or putting Joe Biden in and whomever he has, what do you feel you'll do different or you got going on that they don't? Well, again, I mean, they're the ones that created these problems. If you look at the history of Donald Trump, he's been a crony for decades. He has used the power of government to squash people that are in his way. Uh, you know, widow, widows, old widows who didn't want to sell their property to him, and so he uses the court system to steal their land so that he can build casinos. He leveraged the bankruptcy courts. Uh, anytime that his, you know, grand ideas fell apart, he would, he would leverage the bankruptcy courts to protect his money and basically make it so that his poor, you know, the poor saps who, who you know, bought into his, his, his scheme are the ones who get stuck with the back paying off all the debts. And so he's become a billionaire using government. And now he's in charge of government. Uh, Joe Biden is a career politician who has cozied up with segregationists, who has been a, you know, uh, a, a, a proponent of every bad policy we're facing right now, the war on drugs, the, the so-called tough on crime legislation, the, the militarized police state that we have, civil asset forfeiture. He was the architect of a program where government just steals from people as they see fit uh, without even uh, putting them, uh, convicting them of anything. And then even if, if they're not convicted, they then have to sue for their own stuff back, even though it was never proven that they did anything wrong in the first place. He's the architect of that. He's the architect of every bad policy we're facing, both here uh, in terms of domestically and, and in terms of foreign policy. So here are two people that are synonymous with every bad thing. Donald Trump promised he was going to reduce government and, and, and end the debt, not just the deficit, he was going to end the national debt in, in two terms. He has spent more money and run up more debt in four years than any other president has. Barack Obama had the previous record. It took him eight years to do it. Donald Trump has beaten those records in four years. So anyone who, who wants a fiscal conservative, there's only one, one fiscal conservative running, and that's Joe Jorgensen. If you want someone who is going to dismantle these systems of oppression, like the militarized police state and the war on drugs and the war on sex work and all of these things, there's only one candidate who's going to do that, and that's Joe Jorgensen. So the reality is, it's really up to Donald Trump and, and, and Joe Biden to explain why they should be given second, third, and fourth chances uh, for who, what they've done when they're the ones who are you know, knee-deep and emblematic of every bad policy that the Republicans and Democrats have put forward. Thank you. Uh, next question I wanted to focus more on the military. I believe Joe has talked about um, bringing the troops home. You know, we definitely have heard about candidates before. Oh yeah, when I'm elected, you know, I'm going to I'm going to bring the troops home and can you tell a little bit more about what she means by that and how what is the libertarian stance on when it comes to war and fighting overseas? Absolutely. One of the reasons that we have so much support among veterans and active duty service members is because Joe Jorgensen is the only candidate who is talking about the fact that these wars are not working. They are not making us safer, they are making us less safe. They are, they are driving people to join terrorist organizations to fight back against the invasion and the bombing and, and the destabilization against their countries. It is propping up 
dictatorships across the country, across the world because they promise to be supportive of us. And we've seen in the past what ends up happening with that. Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi, all these people that come into office, you know, we bring them into office on the promise that they'll support us. The uh, the Shah of Iran, all of these things happen. We, we put these dictators in place because they promise to support us. Popular support rises up against us and now the population of that country hates us as a result. This needs to end the cycle of entangling alliances and never-ending war that has essentially been going on since World War I at this point. It needs to end. It's not helping us. We are taking people who are pledging to uphold and defend the Constitution and to protect the American people from threats both foreign and domestic, and then we're sending them overseas to start wars and to destabilize countries. At the only, and the only people benefiting from this are politicians, military contractors, foreign dictators, and the terrorist groups that are having a, 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 a bonanza of recruitment as a result of people trying to fight back. None of the people being helped want anything good for anyone else. And, and it, it's, you know, it's leading to endless uh, caskets being brought back, draped in flags, and countless more people coming back with PTSD and traumatic brain injury and all sorts of other chronic health and mental health issues. Uh, it, it, it's, led, it's helped contribute to the, the, the epidemic of uh, veteran suicides and veteran addiction and veteran homelessness. All of it needs to end. The libertarian position on the military and on war is the same as our founders. We need whatever military is sufficient to protect us against aggression, and our military and the act of war should only be used to direct to protect against direct aggression, not to stop a country whose government doesn't agree with us on something, not to destabilize a country whose government isn't using the petrodollar, none of that. If, if they aren't aggressing against us or aren't actively working to aggress against us, there is no reason to use any kind of military force against them or anyone else. And so that is our position. And it, it is the most popular position. You know, it, it's not for nothing that, again, that active duty troops are getting it and, and they're understanding. They know better than any of us just how failed these wars are because they're the ones who are having to, to prosecute them and they come home and realize just how bad this was. And that's why we have so much support uh, in military and veteran circles. Yeah, I, I do remember, correct me if I'm wrong, I know when four years ago when Gary Johnson was running, I believe three of the four branches of the military all wanted him as opposed to um, Donald, for the most part, you know, wanted Trump, I mean, wanted um, Gary Johnson over Trump and uh, Hillary Clinton. Yeah, all, all, all opinion polling showed like super majorities of people wanting Gary Johnson over, of, of people, uh, of active duty military people wanting Gary Johnson over Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. These are the people who are actually on the ground fighting these wars and on the ground in forward operating bases around the planet. They get it. They know this isn't working. They know better than anyone else that this isn't working. And they know that libertarians are the only ones that are saying that it's not working. We aren't pandering to the military contractors. We aren't pandering to the chicken hawk patriot, uh, you know, who says, oh, send them all to fight all these wars and I'll stay here, you know, safe at home. We aren't pandering to that. We are talking directly to those who are on the ground having to prosecute this, who recognize that it is not working. And we want, when someone signs up and swears to pretend to, to defend and protect the you know American people and the Constitution, that, that's all that they're doing. All that they are doing is they are at the ready in case we are invaded. Uh, Joe Jorgensen says that we're going to end the wars, bring all of the troops home, and turn America into one giant Switzerland, armed and neutral. And that doesn't just mean the military. That means the American people having their right to keep and bear arms completely uninfringed. Thank you. Uh, let's get into something more um, that we just see on the news all the time now. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, ever since I've been around, I've never seen anything talked about on the news for so long, COVID-19. So oh, yeah. I'm sure you have a lot to say about that. What I want to know is what is the libertarian response to COVID-19? How could we have um, taken care of this better or, you know, and then there's the argument, well, I shouldn't have to wear a mask if I don't want to. I don't want the government telling me what to do. You know, but then there's safety issues. So how do we how do we do this in a, a libertarian way of uh, going about tackling this? Well, let's be very clear here, Chris. Republicans and Democrats are the reason why the pandemic is as bad as it is. Let's let's look at the history of what happened here. When the first people that had COVID nineteen were here here in the U S. They go into their doctors. This was back in like early mid January. Okay. 
They're going into their doctors. They're saying, Doc, I don't feel too hot. I just got back from Wuhan, China, or Hubei province, China. I just got back and uh, I'm not feeling really good. And you know, I'm watching TV and they're talking about this coronavirus thing. I'm worried I might have it. For the first six to eight weeks that patients were coming into their doctor's offices and saying this, it was illegal for doctors to test and treat and contain those patients. Let me say that again. A pandemic, the likes of which we've never seen in, 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 mo in the modern era and possibly ever. It was illegal for American doctors to test and treat and contain people who had this virus. Now, thankfully, and the reason for that is because the CDC had this ridiculous regulation in place. The Centers for Disease Control had a ridiculous regulation in place that said that if you want to test for a new virus, a novel virus, you had to go through a months-long process to get approval to test for it. Months long. It takes a matter of, I, I believe, hours to make these test kits. They needed to wait months before they could test one patient. Thankfully, Dr. Helen Chu at the University of Washington in Seattle and a few other doctors across the country, they broke the law. They said, I put my Hippocratic Oath above this absurd regulation. And so they, when, when these patients came in and said they were sick, they created the test kits, which apparently, if you know how to do such a thing, is fairly easy to make. They made the test kits, they tested the patients, some of them came back positive. And they went to the CDC and said, hey, listen, we've been illegally testing, and it's here, we need to do something. The CDC, the, the agency that is in charge of protecting the American people against disease, their initial response to being told that COVID-19 was here was they said, don't tell anybody, destroy all of those test kits, do not tell anyone, including those patients. Send them home, do not test them, do not treat them. And now we know why the pandemic is worse here than in any other country. Because for nearly two months, doctors were actually banned from being able to test for it. And now we fast forward to what's happened as a result. It's completely out of control. And so now the states have stepped in, Republicans and Democrats have stepped in and said, uh, everyone stay home. Don't go outside unless you absolutely have to. Don't go and visit your family. Don't go to church. Don't go to visit small businesses. Don't go to the beach. Don't go to the park. Go to Walmart. Go to Target. Go to Costco. Hundreds of you at, all, at, all at the same time in these same buildings. Go there where it's safe. And uh, the other big businesses that we can't... Oh, and stay home and you know buy stuff on Amazon and, and, and watch things on Netflix. And the big businesses that you can't uh, patronize right now, the airlines and the hotels and the, the banks and the, the Wall Street companies, uh, we'll just bail them all out with your money. We'll give them trillions of dollars and then we'll give you 1200 bucks of your own money that you'll have to pay back and uh, with interest and we'll tell you that uh, you have to stay home until further notice and if, if at any point you disregard us or, or try to live your life the way that you need to, uh, to try to thrive, uh, we will put you in a cage, we'll put you in jail uh, where you will almost certainly get COVID-19. The threat there is very explicit, Chris. Obey us or we will infect you. That is how Republicans and Democrats have dealt with this pandemic. The way George Jorgensen and I would have dealt with that is, first of all, that regulation would have gone away. Any regulation that stops medical professionals from being able to test and treat a highly virulent pathogen, or really anything else for that matter, there's absolutely no reason to have to get approval from the federal government to test for something. These are medical professionals. They know far better than anyone in government how to deal with this. We should simply allow them to do that, which would have stopped the need to do any of this other stuff because it could have been contained. Contact tracing could have been used in order to try to keep the, the spread down and keep it so low so that eventually it could possibly go away entirely, or there might be these little tiny outbreaks of a few dozen or a couple hundred people at a time that don't spread wildly uh, because we would have allowed medical professionals to stomp it out uh, before it could have become this big thing that's now completely out of control. So that's how we would have dealt with that. What about the masks and uh, enforcing that? How, you know, what's the libertarian response to that on how you could tell someone to do something they don't feel like they should have to do? So I have been wearing a mask when I go out, when I go to, uh, not when I'm outside, but like if I go to into a building or into an event or something like that, I wear a mask because from what we're being told, that's the safest way to do it is for everyone to be wearing a mask, especially when we're indoors uh, together um, and uh, you know have some level of social distancing uh, and I think that it is prudent for businesses to choose uh, and, and to choose to tell people that you know if you want to come in here for uh, your safety and, and protection of our liability uh, we also think that you should be wearing a mask in order to come in we as libertarians believe in private property rights which means that if you own a business or a, or a home or a property or anything else you can set the conditions for which people can enter which would include wearing a mask 
Uh, we do this with sh shirts and sh shoes. Businesses tell people, if no shirts, no shoes, no service. And that's just how it is. Some say, hey, listen, if you don't want to wear a shirt, that's fine. Uh, but you know, most of them say you have to wear shirts and shoes. That's not tyranny. That's businesses choosing to tell people that they have to wear that if they want to come into the uh, into the uh, into their establishment. And then we as individuals can choose: do we want to comply and wear the masks and go in, or do we go somewhere else where the masks aren't required? We don't think the government should be getting involved with telling people they can and can't wear masks. And here's why: first of all, it's almost impossible to enforce in any real way. Uh, and uh, second of all. Uh, if the idea is to stop people from getting spreading the virus, the worst way you can do that is to take all of them and huddle them together into a prison or, or a jail with substandard uh, you know, ability to be able to stop the spread of a virus, which means they're even more likely to get it. That's sort of counterproductive. Uh, and it doesn't make sense to issue people fines for it or anything else. We should simply allow, we should make it known what the government should make it known what the risks are, what the dangers are, and what the benefits are of wearing a mask during this time. And also allow businesses to know that, you know, if there's a big outbreak in your business, you could be held uh, civilly liable. You could be sued for, you know, fostering an outbreak in your in your establishment. And allow the market to do what it does. Allow people to make those choices. If people don't want to wear masks and everywhere they go, they're being told you have to wear a mask, they're not going to be going many places. And that's really the best way to deal with that. I think it is common sense right now to be wearing a mask when you're indoors especially. All right. Thank you. Let's see. So uh, our next question is, uh, which is also on the news a lot. We got want to talk about racial equality and everything going on right now. You know, mm -hmm. you know. I remember it was uh, I think it started was it late fall? Uh, the police officer that walked into the one uh, gentleman's apartment thought it was hers, and she she shot him. You yeah. know, and yeah, then we yeah. yeah, and then we had uh, Mr. Aubrey and Mr. Floyd mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Brooks. So we're just trying to figure out, you know. When it comes to law enforcement and racial equality, how do we how do we bridge this gap? So we, we have the data, and the data shows because we can hear a lot of times people say, "Well, they kill white people too." That's correct. They did kill Duncan Lemp, and they did kill I forget his name, but the one where he was you know he was ordered to crawl, uh, you know, uh, and and was given these these contradictory orders that if he couldn't actually do both of them at the same time, and he messed up on one of the orders and was and was you know blasted even though he was clearly no threat. I forget his name. But disproportionately, we, the data shows us that police are considerably more likely to use deadly force in similar situations against people of color uh, than they are against white people. Uh, there's also We also know that there's over-policing in uh, communities of color. We know that uh, white people and black people are roughly likely, uh, say, as likely to use illegal drugs, and yet uh, people of color are something like three or four times more likely to end up convicted and put in jail for drug possession uh, than, uh, you know, than a white person. Same thing with guns. We know that uh, white people are actually considerably more likely to own guns, and black people are something like three or four times more likely uh, to go to jail for owning a gun. So we see this inequality. It is a combination of systemic racism and just over-policing of poor and urban and other marginalized communities, but it all works out to black people getting the short end of the stick when it comes to policing. And the answer to that is to D is to decriminalize uh, m m more situations. So you have an increasing number of situations where you are breaking a law even if you're not really doing anything wrong or harming anyone. So we want to end the war on drugs. We want to, uh, we want to end the war on guns. Uh, we, talk, you know, we talk about that a lot. So getting rid of the DEA, getting rid of the ATF, and allowing people to have whatever arm they want to defend themselves, and allowing people to have uh, to, to use, consume, sell, or buy whatever substance they want in their own body. You own your body. You have the right to put what you want in your body. And there's there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to do that. We, we've seen the harmful and inequitable outcomes that come from creating black markets uh, that you know that that criminalize entire communities and you know put millions of people in jail where they're used for their free prison labor uh, to the benefit of st publicly stock traded. Uh, contractors who make tens of billions of dollars a year off of their free prison labor. Um, it's, a, it's, a new, it's the new slavery. Um, and so we want to end all of that. We also want police to be held accountable. Uh, qualified immunity, uh, you, you may have heard of, qualified immunity is a doctrine that allows police to just not be held accountable. If they decide that what they did was reasonable, 
then they're not held accountable. Imagine if I know that I've been accused of murder and all that, and I, I know I've been accused of all these different things that I did to people, but I think what I did was perfectly reasonable. And the judge goes, oh, well, then I'm going to throw out the charges. That's qualified immunity. And that happens in police departments around the country. Derek Chauvin, who killed George Floyd, who murdered George Floyd, he had 17 other complaints against him, including other complaints of uh, wrongful death. He potentially murdered other people. And the Minneapolis Police Department, when they looked at him, they did the same thing that police departments look at the bad apples in their bunches across the country. They all do the same thing. They looked at him and said, this cop is terrible. He is harming people. We should probably get rid of him. But it will cost us a fortune. We will have to spend a fortune fighting the police unions. They will fight us tooth and nail, and it will cost a fortune, and there's no guarantee we'll even be able to get rid of him. And he's not costing us anything by keeping him on the force because of qualified immunity. None of us are being held liable as a result of it. So cost-benefit analysis, we'll just keep him on. He's eventually going to go too far, possibly murder someone, uh, and then we can remove him much more easily. But in the meantime, we just have to live with it. And that's what happens across the country. That's why bad, officing, bad officers get rewarded and good officers get punished. So we would end qualified immunity. We'd end that civil asset forfeiture program we were talking about earlier. We'd end the 1033 military uh, industrial, uh, the military uh, police program where military surplus program where the military industrial complex is dumping their surplus equipment, their tanks, their armored personnel carriers, their grenade launchers, their armed drones, all of this stuff, giving them to police departments and more importantly, giving them military training on how to use it. So you have police departments that are increasingly getting more and more training from military contractors on using military equipment for military applications. And it shows in the, in the mindset of police, more and more they talk about going into the front lines when they're talking about patrolling. You're not going into the front lines, you're going into our neighborhoods, your neighborhoods. You're going, you're, you're interacting with our, our loved ones and our neighbors. You're not interacting with enemy combatants and it's changing things. They're escalating situations because they're being talked to. And so it's, it's a problem, so that would end as well. Um, and so we will hold police accountable and in doing so, because uh, people of color are the most likely to deal with disproportionate use of force by police by scaling back police and, uh, and, and holding them more accountable, that will benefit everyone, that will benefit all of us, but it will benefit people of color and other marginalized communities all the more. Thank you. Um, next questions I want to talk about is when it comes to insurance, both health insurance and long-term care. Um, obviously, we talk about health insurance all the time and making it more affordable. You know, you have the argument, you know, we should get the government involved and those all these, you know, countries in Europe or um, other parts of the world that have just, it's government ran, you know, everyone just pays into it and it's a much better system. Mm. And I also want to talk a little bit about long-term care. And I don't know if you see it as much down in Myrtle Beach, but in this area, you can't go very far without seeing another retirement community, memory care, a small caregiver unit, because as our baby boomers continue to start retiring, mm -hmm. you know, then there are situations where they can no longer take care of themselves and just and they're to... living longer and longer in a situation where they need help. Yeah. Yes. So what would you say is the libertarian response to making sure that people can get this type of insurance, health insurance, and long term care and it be affordable? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean our healthcare system is a mess. We spend more <laughs> our government spends more per patient in taxpayer dollars than almost every other country on earth, which sounds insane because you hear about other countries where healthcare is free and yet more than likely, depending on that country, the US government is actually spending more per, uh, per, per uh, patient in the US, more per citizen in, in the US than they are and we're definitely not getting free healthcare. Once you factor in what our government is paying and what we are paying out of pocket, we on average spend three times more per patient than the uh, developed country, the de developed nation average. We're spending like over 300% more. It's insane, the amount of money that is being spent. And so the system needs an in complete and entire overhaul. Well, let's look at what causes that. Let's look at why the co cost of healthcare is so high. Recent studies have shown that up around 70 to 75% of the cost of healthcare comes entirely from the cost of complying with red tape from government. That's it. It's before you get into the other stuff that we're about to talk about. Medicare, red tape, uh, and these are, when I say red tape, I'm talking about uh, administrative costs, 
um, uh, uh, regulations uh, and, and uh, taxes and mandates. With Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, mandated health insurance, all of these things, if you just took out all the administrative bureaucratic compliance costs, before you got into anything else, it would reduce the cost of health care between 70 and 75%, right off the bat. Imagine if your health care was three quarters, was a quarter of the price that it is now. That alone would solve the health care problem for most families, just that right there. Now let's talk about patent protections. So. We have a, the, the thing that's actually growing the fastest, when you look at the cost of healthcare, the thing that's growing the fastest is the cost of pharmaceuticals. Well, the reason for that is because you have pharmaceutical companies who are, um, they are uh, leveraging patent protections on old drugs, insulin, epinephrine, stuff that's been around for like a hundred years, stuff that's been around longer than almost all of us have even been alive. And they have a patent on it. This is stuff that costs fractions of a penny to make. Everyone in, in, in the pharmaceutical world could make this stuff you know, easily and cheaply, but only a handful of companies are able to make it because they have the patents and the government enforces those patents against anyone else who would try to make it. And as a result, because they have that closed market, they are able to jack up the price a hundred times, a thousand times what they used to charge and make a huge profit, which actually incentivizes them not to make new drugs. So now new drugs are not being made because they're just squatting on the patents for the old drugs. They don't have to spend money developing new drugs. They just peddle the old drugs and charge a fortune for it. And, uh, and, and that's entirely because of government protection. Then they pass rules saying that it's illegal for us to go to another country and buy it where it's affordable and bring it back here, even though it's legal there, legal here, and we have a legal prescription uh, to be able to get it. We're not allowed to do that to protect the bottom line of those crony billionaires who are making a fortune selling us old drugs that should cost pennies to make or do, do cost pennies to make and they're selling them to us for thousands of dollars at a time. Then we get into certificate of need laws where to protect the existing crony uh, you know, hospital companies and, and healthcare management companies that are already in different regions, if I go into that region and I want to build a new hospital or a new medical center or a new wing to an existing hospital or anything else, I have to beg and scrape to that local municipality and beg them to allow me to build that there. I have to get petition signed, go through a process that sometimes takes years before I'm allowed to even break ground on starting that hospital. And those municipalities don't want to have to do it. It's federal law. They have to do it. They have to do it. Then we get into the fact that if you are a doctor and you have a poor patient come in who you know cannot pay for the cost of their health care, you're not allowed to give it to them for free. You're not allowed to discount it. You have to charge every patient who comes in the exact same thing. All of this contributes to the, to the almost, like something like 85, 90% of the cost of healthcare is just stupid laws from government that necessarily make the cost of healthcare go up. It does not protect the public. It does not protect our health and safety. It is entirely there to protect the, the existing interests of billionaire cronies who have written these laws and handed them, written these regulations and handed them to the politicians and the bureaucrats in their revolving door patronage system that they've set up. So we would get rid of all of that. By getting government out of healthcare, we reduce the vast majority of the costs. We take almost all the costs out of it. We take the vast majority of that cost, bring it down to something affordable, which not only reduces the cost of healthcare and health insurance, it reduces the cost of Medicare. Now Medicare is more affordable. Long-term care, which is just basically lots of medical costs, is now more affordable. All of this stuff becomes more affordable. Anything related to or adjacent to healthcare becomes markedly more affordable as a result of simply removing all of those red tapes and bureaucracy and protection of cronies and putting the, the power of healthcare decision-making out of the hands of those politicians and those bureaucrats and those cronies and putting it back in the hands of patients and providers where it always belong. Perfect. Thank you. So we got, it looks like time for two more questions before we got to part here. Um, Absolutely. I want to know what you think about how we could find ways for people or businesses to raise wages. There's that big argument about raising the wage to $15 and then you know, there's a lot of companies that say, look, I, I just can't afford to do that. And you know, they're called liars that you just don't want to help people or, you know, we could totally raise it to $15 an hour. You make so much money. You know, what's the libertarian response to that? 
Yeah, so let's be clear. The reason that big business cronies are using their paid media that they own to push for uh, minimum wage increases, the reason is very clear. They know that their smaller competitors can't afford it. They can afford it. Amazon can afford 15 bucks an hour. Walmart can afford 15 bucks an hour. Costco can afford 15 bucks an hour. Netflix can afford 15 bucks an hour. Microsoft, most of the people working for them are already making more than that anyway. Same with Facebook, same with Google, same with all of the companies who run our media. Who can't afford it? The small business down the street. The upstart trying to start a disruptive company to, to challenge the market share of those existing cronies. That's why they're doing it. Now, the reality is that a, a large and growing number of Americans make less money than it costs to live. This isn't just a problem of the poor anymore. It's now a problem of the middle class. And so it can be tempting to say, well, let's just raise the minimum wage. But that doesn't really solve the problem. We know what happens when minimum wage, uh, minimum wage increases happen. A lot of the companies that can't afford it go out of business. So there's now fewer employers, which means that the supply of jobs has gone down and the demand for jobs has gone up, which means that the ability for laborers to negotiate for the kind of terms and conditions they want has just gone down. So you might find someone who will pay you 15 bucks, but probably not any more than that because they don't have to, because there's a ton of people out there behind you that are willing to work if you're not. Also, the other thing that happens is if everyone knows that everyone's making more money, the cost of everything goes up. And so now, you just, whatever increase in your pay just, uh, was added, the, the, the cost of living has been increased even more. So it actually puts the very people that it pretends to help in the worst possible position, along with all of those businesses that have to go out of business because they can't afford. Or if they don't go out of business, they just fire everyone and do the work themselves, which means they remain smaller, they can't get bigger, and they can't hire anyone because they can't afford the cost of the labor. Um, all, the only people that truly benefit from this are those self-same billionaire cronies who push these ideas and push these regu regulations and legislation because they know that it will choke out the competition. Um, so let's deal with the actual solution. What is the solution here? First of all, the problem is twofold. There aren't enough uh, uh, jobs that are wanted uh, and there aren't uh, or, or job positions being filled. The economy is not doing well enough uh, for more jobs to be created here. Uh, which would tighten the supply the, the uh, supply of people who are able to work, which would necessarily bring up the cost of, uh, of, um, of, of, of wages. And the other problem is that the cost of living continues to outstrip average wage growth. Well, the problem with the uh, economy not growing fast enough is all those barriers that the cronies have put in place to stop small businesses and entrepreneurs from being able to rise up. You remove those barriers, those burdens, those taxes, and those mandates, and now suddenly there's much more that can happen in terms of new businesses coming up and entrepreneurs working for themselves and all sorts of other ways for the economy to become much more dynamic and fast growing and threaten the market share of the big cronies, which is why they put those rules in place. Get rid of those rules. The only people who don't benefit from it are those billionaire cronies. I say they made enough money. If they want to continue to, to keep their market share and stay multi-billionaires, good. They can compete with everyone else like they should have from the beginning. And uh, the other thing that happens is, again, uh, people are making more money and the, uh, the supply of, of labor uh, isn't uh, able to keep up with the demand for, for labor, which means that wages have to go up because if there's, if there's a shortage of workers, you got to pay more to try to get them from, from one of your competitors. So that makes wages go up. The other thing that, uh, and then looking at the other problem, which is the cost of living. That's the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve prints out endless reams of trillions of dollars every year that they use to hand off to government uh, in the form of buying treasury bonds. They basically lend it to government, make you pay it with interest for 40 years every single time, every single day that they buy more treasury bonds from the government to uh, allow them to fund all of their various uh, things that we really would rather they not do, like the war on drugs and imprisoning tens of millions of Americans and, uh, and who, who didn't actually harm anyone. They just engaged in victimless commerce that the government said is illegal. Uh, and also to continue these wars and everything else. Uh, in order to do that, they, every time that they, they get more bonds, you're now paying that off with interest. Four year, new 40 year loans being taken out in your name every single day that you have to pay off, your children have to pay off, their children have to pay off, and possibly even their children have to pay off with interest. But worse yet, by printing out all that money and inflating the money supply more and more and more, it reduces the value of, that, of, of each, of each uh, Federal Reserve note within that money supply. So all those Federal Reserve notes 
those dollar bills that you've got in your pocket, in your wallet, that you use in your bank account, that you use to buy and, uh, and, and rent the things that you need to survive, they become worth less and less, which means that the cost of living just steadily goes up over time. Before the Federal Reserve, the cost of living went up and down with supply and demand. Some years it would go up, some years it would go down, some years it would stay roughly the same. So for the, the 100 years before the Federal Reserve existed, the cost of living really didn't go up that much. It went up slightly, but also uh, the average uh, wealth of the average American during that 100 years more than tripled. So the average American did much better uh, 100 years later. Fast forward to now, in 1913, uh, they created the Federal Reserve, and two things happened. The following year, we went to war and have never stopped since. And the uh, and then the other thing that's happened is that the cost of living goes up anywhere from three to ten percent every single year. No matter if we had a good year economically, a bad year economically, doesn't matter. It just keeps going up because they keep inflating the money supply. So the way we deal with that is we get rid of the Federal Reserve and we replace it with a system whereby uh, competing providers compete to provide you with the best currency free market banking and currency so that now the people that are issuing your currency, instead of having a vested interest in, in printing out endless currency that they can use to spend on their own political uh, their own political goals and their own, their own whatever they want to spend it on, spreading their empire, instead, they know if they did that, it would lose value and you go and put your money elsewhere. So now they have a vested interest in keeping the value of your currency high and actually having it gain value over time so that you stay, stay with them because they get a piece of it every time you use their currency. Imagine a situation in which you have competing providers saying, use our money, use our money, our money's better, our money's better, so that your, your, your cost of living actually goes down over time. Your money becomes more valuable over time. That is the, the reality that we will have when we have the Federal Reserve. So the problem isn't that you know employees or, or employers are choosing not to, to, uh, to pay you enough. The problem is the barriers that have put, been put in place that make it hard for them to grow, which means that your labor is not worth as much. And again, the problem is the Federal Reserve jacking up the, uh, the price, the cost of living every year. So by solving those problems, your money's worth a lot more. The, uh, just to drive home how little this has to do with, with the actual what your wage is, the Federal Reserve note in the last 107 years is now worth today two cents on the dollar what it was worth when the Federal Reserve was created. Imagine if your money was worth 50 times what it is now. Mm. That's the problem. So we end the Fed, we get rid of those barriers, you do a lot better. All right, Spike, thank you. I know we've pretty much just got like two minutes left. Is there anything else you'd like to close with? Any final thoughts? Absolutely, folks. If you like what you heard and want to hear more, I invite you to go to our website, joj2020.com. That's joj2020.com. Uh, if you'd like to join our team, there's a volunteer form that you can fill out. We'd love to have you join the team. Uh, and if you'd like to make a contribution, there is a donate button there. We'd love to get a donation from you if you're able to do so. And share our content. Join us on social media. Join our, our Facebook group, the Joe Jorgensen Spike Cohen for President, Vice President 2020 group. Um, Follow us on social media, share our content, tell your friends and loved ones why you uh, are a libertarian and why you support our ticket. Um, if we can get Joe Jorgensen on that debate stage, I believe that we'll win this election and we can start solving the problems that the Republicans and the Democrats have created. And Chris, I just really appreciate you coming on, uh, having me come on your show. And, uh, and I appreciate everyone that has, uh, that has tuned in to, to listen to this. And I appreciate it. Great.